Welcome guys, welcome back to Minko's Corner once again. I know, I know, alright, I missed a day. Uh, I had issues, okay, I changed my power supply, so that was one thing. And I missed a day because of that, you know, I slept 13 hours yesterday, so, you know. <laughs> it's a little bit more complicated, let's just say that uh, I, didn't, uh, I didn't succeed on the first try. Anyways. Um, today we're back with uh, Aurelian Orléans, you know, very nice guy. 76 battle, we're 76 guys, 25 more, 24 more to 100, and then sky's the limit a thousand, a million, easy. Now, thank you, truly, I really appreciate every single one of you guys um, that have subscribed, linked, comment, all that. And just just watched as well. Uh, anyways, we're back today with Aurelian. Last time, what we left off was this badass general rising from the ashes. Basically, the whole empire was collapsing around him. He rose. He, you know, started punching uh, other generals, other emperors in the face. And now he's going back to Syria, you know, because there's this chick, you know, who is trying to, you know, observe control, and we'll see what happens. Hey guys, if you missed part one of this mini-series, you can find it here. Oh, oh, oh. Yep. Following the victory over the Goths in the Balkans, the flagging morale of the Roman forces had been restored, Meh. and with a restructured Danubian frontier, Aurelian could now muster strong field armies for the campaigns ahead without compromising the empire's security. The emperor wintered in Byzantium, making preparations for the upcoming war with Zenobia and ensuring that the borders would be protected in his absence. Considerable manpower was allocated to defend the Balkans against the tribes from across the Danube. Those Troops tribes. were stationed in Italy to prevent a possible return of the Alamanni and the Iatungi. Mm. And in Narbonne, I believe that the Gallic, the, I don't think the Gallic Empire is going to survive this when he comes back. <laughs> His goal, a substantial presence of imperial troops, was required to guard against the Gallic Empire. By spring 272, Aurelian had mustered his own army in Thrace and had completed all preparations. How many? Zenobia, seeing that war with Aurelian was now inevitable, had her son Vabalathis declared Augustus, and had herself proclaimed Augusta, the traditional title of a Roman empress. Mm. But because of the Palmarine failure to secure Bithynia, Aurelian was easily able to secure a bridgehead and march into Asia. Mm -mm -mm. He sent a second force to make a naval landing in Egypt under the talented Marcus Aurelius Probus, the future emperor. Is he one of the good ones? Marcus Aurelius, the father of Commodus? Don't tell me it's him! The logistical planning and execution of this invasion marked Aurelian as one of the greatest military thinkers of the 3rd century AD. His plan was a pincer movement yeah. on a massive scale, a true masterclass in strategic warfare. This video is brought to you by the Ridge Wallet. It's Jesus light, Christ. sleek, and in. I know the wallet by heart now. The first was to recapture those parts of the empire over which Zenobia had recently established her dominion. Mm -hmm. The most important of these were the wealthy provinces of Asia Minor. With you know what's the most uh, fascinating to me? Is seeing uh, 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 cities that were named in 300 AD, and th th those cities are still alive today. You know, like Rome, Antioch, Alexandria, Damascus. I mean, there are still cities <laughs> that were made millenniums ago, and they're still around. I mean, that's insane. ...significant tax contribution to the coffers of the imperial government and Egypt with its vital supply of grain. The Mediterranean area of Syria, particularly the city of Antioch, was of secondary but still considerable importance. Yep. 
The Emperor's second objective was to eliminate Zenobia. Let's read this. Let's uh, want to return to be more powerful than me. Zenobia the Bad. Zenobia the Bad. Uh, alive, rough, your beloved leader. Ten million denarii. Yes. And to reduce the power of Palmyra so as to avoid a repeat of this dangerous situation. However, Aurelian knew that Syria would be heavily defended and that a prolonged war there was possible. This would prevent him from reaching Egypt by land, which he urgently needed to recover to secure a steady flow of grain, as well as revenues from the Red Sea trade. This was the main reason for his ambitious naval invasion to open a second front. Yep. The Roman fleet reached the Nile Delta sometime in the spring of 272. Mm -mm. Very little is known about the campaign itself. Upon making landfall, Probus initially fought with success, but was then nearly captured. Mm. Further reinforcements helped him gain a foothold against the Palmyrene garrison, and by early June, Alexandria was safely back in Aurelian's control. Probus months, then began operations to retake the rest of Egypt. Meanwhile, after crossing into Asia Minor, the advancing Roman column was triumphantly welcomed by the inhabitants of Bithynia, yeah, they didn't who like successfully her, huh? resisted Zenobia's domination. They didn't like her. In Galatia, any Palmyrene troops stationed there were certainly not numerous. You know what's fascinating to me? How certain cultures survive conquest, others don't. Because this here, you know, Byzantium, Anatolia, it was all Greek. You know, they all spoke Greek. It was all, you know, it, and all the, uh, the codified language, um, the, the rule of law was all Latin. And then uh, 2,000 years later, give or take, millennia and a half, everybody speaks Turkish and they're all Muslim. <laughs> Enough to stop Aurelian's army, and they quickly withdrew to the southeast, bringing valuable intelligence about Aurelian's advance. Yeah. With Even the loose Ankara Palmarine is. hegemony evaporating before him, the emperor was welcomed without a struggle by the citizens of Ankira, Why the did provincial people... capital. They didn't like her at all. <laughs> After making sure that his supply lines were secure, from here he proceeded southeast towards the Cilician Gates, a cosmic pass through the Taurus Mountains that connected the Anatolian Plateau with the Cilician Plains and Syria beyond. Whoa. That However, be before he could reach the pass, ambush. his route took him to the town of Tiana in Cappadocia, Resistance? which was strategically located along the route to Syria. The town refused to open its gates, but Aurelian could not afford to leave a hostile garrison along his lines of supply. Angered, he ordered the city besieged, pledging that he would not leave even a dog alive once the city had fallen. Whoa. Dude, that's a, <laughs> that's a serious threat, man. Desirous of plunder, his soldiers pursued the siege with all the more determination. The machine-like manner with which the Romans slowly choked the city over the course of several weeks spread fear among some sections of the population. With the pressure mounting, Tiana capitulated when one of the frightened residents betrayed the city to the emperor by showing to him a weakness in the wall. Killing the everybody? capital of Cappadocia was now in the Emperor's hands. Oh, is he killing everybody? But Aurelian thought better of his previous intention to massacre Tiana. Ooh, okay. With an insight rare among third century emperors, he realized that sparing the city would set a precedent far more potent in the coming conflict. He ordered his army not to harm Tiana thus presenting himself to the populace as a liberator rather than a conqueror. Yeah, playing but the his PR troops image. were none too pleased. They expected to be allowed <laughs> to plunder the city and angrily demanded that Aurelian stand by his promise. This was indeed a dangerous move. Yeah, Amidst the heightened political military tensions of the 3rd century, many an emperor and usurper were lynched by their own soldiers for refusing plunder. 
That Aurelian managed to survive this encounter reflects his ability to foster strong relations with his soldiers at a time when armies were prone to rebellion against their commanders. Not allowing himself to be intimidated by his men, the Emperor admitted that he had indeed ordered that no dog in Tiana be allowed to live. Oh my God. Accordingly, he ordered his soldiers to kill all dogs in the city. <laughs> the anger of the soldiers was dispelled by their laughter at this response. Aurelian went on to explain his decision to the troops. We waged war to free these cities. If we pillage them, they will never trust us. This display of sound political judgment showed that he understood that Zenobia was a... I mean, it makes complete sense when you think about it. And, you know, if you destroy the city and you go to the next city, yes, they will, you know, they will be afraid of you and they will surrender. But there won't be any loyalty there. You know, if you make them a promise, I don't know. ...a formidable foe and that he had better chances of defeating her through clemency rather than terror. In my opinion, you have to have both. You have to have fear, but you have to have love as well. Because Tywin Lannister, as some might you know, I love that show, I love Game of Thrones, but Tywin Lannister was pure fear, you know? And when he died, the whole dynasty would collapse after him. That's just how it happened, because, you know, people, there's a certain point, like, people fear, you know, fear, very powerful weapon. But there's a certain point where fear is like, you become numb to it, and you're like this, I'm done, you're done, and you start hating, and you hate, and then, so you have to have a balance, you can be all fear, you can be all love as well, because of his father, Titus, who was all love, and look how it happened, so you have to have both, you have to be lovable, but if they fuck with you, you kill them all. Right. With the capture of Tiana, the way to Syria now lay open. Aurelian's army marched into Cilicia without resistance, likely passing through Tarsus, the provincial capital, before heading east through Issus, where Alexander the Great had won his famous victory over the Persians. Mm, yeah. From here, the Roman Emperor reached the port of Alexandretta. What's this, the daughter of Alexander? Although he had gained control over Asia Minor with relative ease, before him now lay Syria, the heartland of Palmarine power. Yeah. Meanwhile in Egypt, Probus managed to topple the resistance and regain control of the province. He then proceeded to march towards the Levant. Uh -oh. He pressed the Palmarines from the south and perhaps secured the loyalty of the Cyrenian Third Legion in Arabia which had been previously subdued and its general killed by Zenobia. To address this, Zabdas detached a considerable force in anticipation of Probus's advance on Palmyra. Having lost Alexandria, the queen now had one remaining mint under her control in Antioch. Mm -mm. Knowing that this would be Aurelian's first objective in Syria, it was here that she and her generals stationed Palmyra's forces in preparation for the Roman advance. Okay, let's see. Aurelian's army consisted of legionary detachments drawn from Okay, Iraq. let's pause, let's pause. 36,000 total. 29,000 troops, uh, infantry, and 7,000 cavalry. Aitia, right. Noricum, Pannonia, and Moesia as well as Praetorians and Moorish and Dalmatian cavalry, who served as elite mounted units. Okay, how many more? 36 k Zabda's army consisted of Palmarines and... Pretty cool, pretty cool. I say, you know, if, it, if this was Napoleon, the guy who was, you know, would be running right now, but... Uh, <laughs> but, no, 36 42, pretty even, pretty cool. Um, other Syrians, I wonder if they're going to use the lake. also various other Roman units that had declared their loyalty to Queen Zenobia's family. Oh my god, turn Palmyra's close. Palmyra's greatest advantage over Aurelian's army was their Clebanari, or super heavy cavalry. Oh. These mounted units were better armored and more numerous than Aurelian's Dalmatians and Moors. Mm -mm -mm. 
The Roman Emperor began crossing over the mountains. He had received unwelcome reports that the Palmarines lay between him and Antioch. Zabdas drew up his army in the Orontes Plain on the western... He should have went for that tunnel. If he was somehow was able to fight uh, inside that very small space, because you have bigger numbers, you can kill more people, uh, sacrifice more people. And because th there aren't any way for your enemy to sort of, you know, uh, flank you, it will be a numbers game. You're going to lose a lot, you know. Inside of the Lake of Antioch to the north of the city. Here, he could intercept Aurelian's advance along the road from Alexandretta at a narrow point where the flat terrain was especially well suited to the battle tactics of the Palmarine heavy mailed cavalry. However, Aurelian refused to fight Zabdas on the battlefield of his own choosing. Knowing that a direct assault would be to surrender operational and tactical advantage to the enemy, he instead decided to march to the east of the lake, seeking to outflank the Palmarine position. <laughs> This maneuver had three advantages. First, the Palmarines anticipated a frontal assault from the north and might become confused by an attack from their rear. Mm -hmm. Second, he would block the enemy's line of retreat to the east, and if he could reach the city, he could also close off the road leading south. Lastly, the terrain south of the lake was less suited to Zabda's formidable cataphracts. However, the Palmarine general got wind of Aurelian's maneuver. I mean, yeah, they're not so far away, man. It's like one lake. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that she could see across it. <laughs> like... Having already stationed a small contingent to guard the road to Baroya, he sent his elite heavy cavalry to bolster their ranks. He could ill afford to lose his line of retreat, so it was imperative that they intercept Aurelian's army on the plain to the east of the lake before they could reach the hilly terrain further south, where his cavalry would be at a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. The Emperor's scouts soon brought back reports of Palmarine movements. Realizing he had lost the element of surprise, Aurelian led most of his cavalry ahead of the main body of the oh army. Oh my god, it's gonna be a cavalry versus cavalry? He was well aware of the fearsome reputation of the Klibanari, and did not want to risk his infantry against Zabdas's heavy cavalry. Cavalry versus cavalry, man. This is gonna be awesome. It's gonna be epic. It was a hot June morning. Oh my god. The Roman lit. Emperor marched at pace well ahead of the rest of the army, with a cavalry contingent of around 5,000 strong, hoping to outflank Zabdas at Antioch. With him, he had the veteran Dalmatian and Moorish light cavalry, which had been under Aurelian's command for a number of years before he became emperor, serving as the elite cavalry arm of the Roman army. They were a tactically astute branch of the military, capable of executing battle plans across vast distances with precision, and had participated in numerous campaigns, often being the deciding factor in major engagements. However, Aurelian found that his way was blocked by the Palmarine heavily armored cavalry, arrayed on the Antioch Baroya Road. Zabdas's cataphracts were of even better quality than Aurelian's Dalmatians and Moors. Okay, what the fuck? These what troops happened? had been forged in the fire of the Persian wars. If he sent the fire, my doom, I would have just. <laughs> and perhaps represented the very pinnacle of cavalry warfare in the third century AD. It is likely that Zabdas fielded up to 5,000 of these troops at Ime but their exact strength and composition remains unclear. The Palmarines traditionally used light cavalry and dromedary archers, so it is possible that these heavy cavalry units were not local and were in fact cataphracts of the Roman army in the east, which were controlled by Queen Zenobia. Rome employed such units as an answer to Persian cataphracts, and they would have been controlled by Zenobia's husband before he was assassinated. This further confirms that the conflict between Rome and Palmyra was, in fact, a civil war. 
Despite this, ancient sources descended from Aurelian's propaganda portrayed Palmyra as an external enemy, even though they were an integral part of the empire. Get the centuries. hell out of here. Further evidence of this propaganda can be seen in their portrayal of Zenobia as an eastern barbarian, a foreigner, despite her family having senatorial status. <laughs> yeah, it's all about, you know, controlling the press, controlling the media. It's very important. If you can control the media, you can paint up your enemy however you like. You know, you can paint them as, you know, the most evil of the world. And, you know, back in the day, people didn't have access to the knowledge. And the, the amount of people who were knowledgeable enough to be, like, discerning of the truth. You know, you tell the peasants who farm their farm their whole life, they don't know how to read, that out there somewhere there's, you know, an evil queen who's trying to destroy everything you own, trying to burn your crops and kill your children. You don't know better, you know. The fact that she was of Syrian descent was clearly used against her by the central imperial government. Very smart. Very Aurelian very smart. presented Zenobia's son as an illegitimate ruler, oh. but ironically, it was Aurelian himself who lacked senatorial status before he took power. He was an Illyrian general who killed his way to the throne, overthrowing Quintilius, and, according to some sources, he played a role in the assassination of Emperor Gallienus. I mean, it's all about power, right? You know, if you have it, you're right. If you don't, you're wrong. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's if she had won that war, which the way things are going, I don't think she's gonna. Uh, she was gonna make her own truth, her own. She's gonna was gonna tell her tale, but because she's most likely to lose, she was lost in the annals of history. You know, at the end of the day, especially back then, military power was everything. If you had strength, you could tell the truth or your truth compared to, you know, everybody else's. You can dictate a truth that everybody would have to follow. Aurelian did eventually Not much has changed, has it? get senatorial support, but he had earned it through brute force. Likewise, the troops it. from both yeah. armies used to be part of the Roman military before the war. Oh my god, this is brother versus brother here. At Ime, the two commanders fielded their best mounted contingents, both understanding the importance of the opening encounter. Mm -mm. Around mid-morning, Aurelian gave the signal. On the other end, Zabdas rose oh, to God, the it's challenge. Like when two cars are trying to go to one another to see who's chicken, and then at the last second someone just, you know, drifts away. The heavily armored cataphracts were oh encouraged, God. seeing the light Dalmatian and Moorish cavalry. What's happening? Little did they know that Aurelian was one of the finest cavalry commanders of his time. Oh. Just before the first charge of the enemy, he instructed his men to wheel about and not risk close quarters combat Whoa. with their heavier counterparts. Smart, smart. Exactly. The light armed cavalry feigned retreat, inviting the enemy to give chase. Oh, this no. encouraged the Palmarines to press forward in anticipation of an easy victory. Whenever a minor clash occurred, Aurelian's lighter units would flee. With each charge of Zabdas's cataphracts, the nimble Dalmatians and Moors used their speed to avoid the confrontation and retreat along the main road towards the town of Ime. The Palmarines pursued the Romans for several kilometers. Soon enough, the Syrian midday sun began taking its toll. True to the word, Clebanarius, meaning oven man, the Palmarine Clebanari and their horses suffered in the heat, having maintained the chase in their heavy armor. Aurelian noticed the exhaustion of the enemy. On cue, he turned his cavalry and countercharged the pursuers. Taken by surprise, the Clebanari could not put up an effective resistance, nor flee their nimble enemy. The slaughter was terrible. Dude, the time was so smart because he was able to take the advantage of the enemy and turn into a disadvantage. Because, you know, everybody has advantages and disadvantages for everything. 
And when you take an advantage of an enemy, in this case, you know, battlefield, you see his advantage, you're like, okay, if I let him use his advantage completely, I'm done. So how can I counter it? They're heavy. They're gonna get tired easily or faster than I will. I'm gonna make them run. I mean, it's very smart, you know, but you have to tell your truth beforehand or just they're just gonna pass and I keep to sell them to retreat. Tired heavy horsemen were either slain in their saddles or thrown off their horses and mangled by the hooves of friend and foe. Few managed to escape the carnage and find their way back to Antioch. Jeez. Aurelian's tactics at Ime relied on the veteran Dalmatian and Moorish... How is he not more known? Th that was brilliant. ...cavalry, their steely discipline, courage, and their ability to yeah. coordinate an effective and timely counterattack after retreating a great distance. Their deadly efficiency demonstrated the Emperor's tactical expertise, as well as his experience as a cavalry commander. In one fell swoop, he had dealt a crippling blow to Palmyra's Nearly most all powerful... Nearly all 5,000 people died. Nearly. Let's say 4,000. ...military asset, their vaunted, heavily armored cavalry. However, further to the south, the Palmarines still possessed cavalry that far outnumbered those available to the Emperor, including a reserve of cataphracts. Ooh. Aurelian knew that the battle had by no means secured the defeat of Zenobia's regime, and that the outcome of the war was yet to be decided. Credit goes to our awesome patron. This was the last awesome video. Only one more part, I think. Or maybe more. I think there are going to be more parts. Uh, but this was really good. This was really good. I'm sorry. You know, some things are taking time. You know, I'm sorry, guys. I kept you waiting. I hope you like my reaction. This was awesome. It was a brilliant uh, victory. You know, um, talk about, you know, being smart and not rushing into things. You know, thinking it over. Everything he was, he looked from his decisions as a very, how should I put this? Intellectual, yes, but more than that, very uh, cautious and a visionary in terms of he 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 knows what his actions will provoke as an outcome. You know, when uh, he decided to not kill the citizens in his past town to kill them all, it was you know he could have lost the control of his army. It was you know calculated risk, but in the long run, I think it's better. You know, because you gained the loyalty now, because you had them at their mercy, and you could have killed them every, everybody. But then they're going to fight so much more fiercely for you because you spared them. Um, and to not rush right away. You know, when he came from the past, from Antioch, he could have rushed right away. He didn't. He stopped. He's like, you know what, I'm going to go around the lake. I'm not going to risk it. I'm going to find the best advantage for myself. Brilliant, once again. Uh... Let's see, footnote, General Zabdas and the survivors of the Battle of Ime rejoined the main preliminary army and retreated to Antioch, where Sehobia herself awaited the rest of the preliminary force for the Damascus Street River. Ah, that's interesting. Um, so I was I was mistaken. It wasn't Antioch they were coming from. It was another city, Alexandra Attack. That's right, Alexandra Attack. Um, so I hope you liked my reaction. If you did, like, subscribe and all that. And I'll see you guys next time. See you.